Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, it's great to see you uh, once again here on a Sunday morning. We're studying Gospel of John in a series called God So Loved. If you're new with us or if you've missed the message along the way in the series, you can either go to our website or you can download our mobile app to your smartphone or tablet and you can either watch the messages or listen. For today, go ahead and open your Bible or turn it on to John chapter 5 and we will get there in just a moment. Last Sunday, we started chapter 5, and we looked at the story of an invalid, a man who had been an invalid for 38 years, and how Jesus intersected his life and healed this guy. If you weren't here, you're going like, you'll just need to read and catch up. We looked at just nine short verses. If you were here, it's a good reminder, oh yeah, that dude, I remember that now. So for 38 years, he was an invalid, and now Jesus intersects his life. He heals him here, there by the pool of Bethesda. And it's like a miracle of all miracles. It was like phenomenal of what Jesus did in this man's life. He touched him and he made him whole. But let me ask you a question. When you think about wholeness and you think about life change, is it always easy to maintain and implement the changes in your life once you've made them? I mean, even if Jesus has intersected your life, is it always easy and natural? So here's a question. Um, New Year's wasn't that long ago. Some of you made New Year's resolutions. Some of you haven't kept them. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't want you to go, oh yeah, I made one and oh, I feel terrible. I haven't kept them. I'm not here to make you feel bad, right? But it's just this idea that making a change and having a change in your life and then continuing it is two totally different things. I mean, how many people have taken Financial Peace University... And they've learned biblical principles for financial money management. And they've started working the budget. And wives and husbands are going like, ooh, wow, I didn't know. Look how much we have left. I didn't know. It's amazing. And then month after month goes. They're working the plan. The plan's working. And then there comes a season where life gets hectic, gets busy. They bail on the plan. And then they're going like, why are we so stressed about money? We had plenty back then. Why are we short now? Stop working the plan. What they'd implemented was tough. It didn't last automatically. You've got to work it. How many people have come to faith in Jesus? And then they've started reading his word. And they're going like, man, it's amazing. And they start reading it. And they start incorporating it into their lives. And they're like, amazing. They feel so close with Jesus. They feel so much at peace like never before. And then life happens. And they're going like, I just don't know what happened. And all of a sudden they're going like, I stopped the discipline. I stopped the practice of reading God's word. I stopped my communion with God. And it's like, it's it's obvious to see. I mean, we could go example after example and say, you know what? Life change is not always easily maintained. We have to work and we have to drive and we have to make certain we're focused in order for it to be lasting. Last Sunday, we talked about the fact that Jesus' love makes us whole. We saw the invalid get healed. Today, we're going to talk about the idea that Jesus' love not only makes us whole, like we saw last week, but it keeps us whole. He maintains us. He holds us close so that we can maintain this wholeness that He incorporates into our lives. So again, how does that happen? John chapter 5, we saw this invalid man. 38 years, Jesus gave him some very, very specific instructions. He said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Today we're going to pick up in the second half of verse 9. Something interesting we learn there. Here's what Scripture says. The day on which this took place, the healing, was on the Sabbath. Very important. We'll come back to that in just a moment. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. So understand, Jews, Pharisees, these legals had rules for everything. There were actually 613 you had to follow to be a good Jew. One of them was this. On the Sabbath day, you cannot carry anything weighing more than a dried fig. Going, how bizarre and how weird. Different culture, okay? We don't carry dried figs, okay? I get it. But you're going like, well, do they vary in weight at all? I mean, what's the litmus test for this? Anything more than a dried fig, on the Sabbath, you could not carry. Verse 11. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. 
So picture this. These Pharisees had seen this guy gathered around the pool. An invalid couldn't walk for 38 years. He's healed miraculously. The next thing they know, they see the dude walking. And he's like, got his mat tucked under his arm. You know, some of you workout people, you know, you carry your little mat in. Okay. He just, he's chilling, carrying his mat. And they're going like, not supposed to do that. It's the Sabbath. What you are carrying weighs more than a dried fig, dude. In verse 12, they continue to press him. They ask him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. These guys see him carrying his mat. It's on the Sabbath. And here's the bottom line question they're asking. Who is it that told you it was okay to break the law? They're completely missing the miracle. And all they want to know is who gave you permission to do this on the Sabbath. Today we're going to see four changes that we should make in our lives once Jesus has made us whole in order to maintain and keep our wholeness. Four changes. And we're going to look at this passage, this story, and learn these together. They come out of this encounter between the Pharisees and this man who had just been healed. See, the Pharisees, they skipped entirely over the miracle, and the only thing they looked at was the rule that was being broken, the law that was being broken. So this is the first thing that we have to do. The first change we've got to incorporate is this. We have to reject legalism. We have to reject legalism. That is the first thing that happens here. They're wanting to say, hey, dude, you broke the law. It was a Sabbath. You shouldn't carry a mat. And we're going to see as this passage unfolds how this gets corrected. They didn't see the healing. All they saw was a lawbreaker. Now, maybe you're here and you're going like, okay, well, what is legalism? Is that like when you're doing 57 and a 55? You're going like, oh, man, that's not much at all. That can't be legalism, right? So let's get a working definition of legalism before we dig in a little bit deeper. Here's a definition of legalism. Legalism is trying to earn our way to God by following a list of rules and regulations. We're trying to earn our way to God. We're trying to get closer to God by keeping a list of rules and regulations. And some people have those nice long lists of do nots and you should do's. And sometimes people will finger point and go like, you did that. Isn't that on your list? Are you really permitted to do that? So, now that we have a working definition of legalism, let's see how it affects us in our Christian walk. Write this down. Legalism, it really blinds us to the miraculous work of God. That is one effect of legalism. Following rules, following regulations, it blinds us to the miraculous work of God. All of a sudden, we're seeing and experiencing life change. And instead of being in, the awe of, being in awe of God and giving God the glory for the changes that are taking place in our lives, we're going like, man, I did these six things and look what I did. Man, I, look, this, this is because of me. It's because of my work. It's my effort instead of it being the effort and the work of Jesus. It's rules. It's regulations. It's this idea that if I do this, then God will love me more. If I don't do this, God will accept me more. We're trying to earn our way to God, earn His favor by following a prescribed list of rules and regulations. Now, not only does legalism uh, blind us to the miraculous work of God, it also binds us to the meticulous rules of man. It binds us to the meticulous rules of man. All of a sudden, people have these lists. And people have this idea and this perception, man, if I don't use any of the words on the church's do not use list, God's going to love me more. You're going like, dude, do they have a list here? (laughs) Some people are going like, man, you know what? It's not only uh, maybe the words that I say, maybe it's even deeper than that. And it's all kind of thoughts that I have. Man, I wonder if it could be that. Maybe it's the fact, oh man, if I, I just can't watch any of the shows on the church's do not watch list. Oh, some of you have been in churches with lists. It's legalism. You're trying to earn and work your way to God, and it's not God's plan. It's not God's plan at all. Now, we see that it's the, 
the, the, the idea of man drives people, and we miss the work of God. Why does it really matter at the bottom line? It's, it's this. Legalism gives us a false sense of holiness. We go, oh, wow, I'm, I've got it pretty well. I've got it together today. Everything's looking good. It's feeling good. I think I'm, it's because I'm doing the plan. It's because of what I'm doing instead of what God is doing in us. We get confused with a false sense of holiness. It's false. I want to give you a suggested additional reading. Write down on your sermon notes Hebrews 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, there's some legalists, some Jews, some Pharisees who are trying to earn their way to God, and they're trying to do it through sacrifice. They're saying, man, if I just do this, then God's going to love me. In verse 10 of Hebrews 10, here's what God's Word says. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's not the rules you keep. It's not the sacrifice you offer. What matters is Jesus Christ came, He lived, He died, and His sacrifice was sufficient once and for all. You see, that goes in the face of legalism. It goes right in the face. Satan's strategy is to confuse us and to draw our attention away from the sanctifying work of Jesus and try to make us think it's on our own initiative. It's our rules. It's our regulations. It's what we do. Now, before you're going like, man, that's really liberating. Understand what we have to hold in tension. As we read the pages of Scripture... We have to understand there are some commands in here that God wants and expects us to keep. Oh, yeah, I knew you were going to get back to the rule keeping, dude. You can't not. You got to, right? No, no, no. Hold on. Stay with me. We can read God's word and we understand that, yeah, you know what? There is a thing called the Sabbath day and we're to keep it holy. We're to honor God on that day. We can read through the teachings of Scripture and you can say God has a big, big importance on money. And yes, he expects his followers to give a dime of every dollar back to him through the local church. You're going like, oh man, I see there, there's, that, there's those rules again. But here's the deal. How you live these out and the motivation behind putting these in practice in your life is what matters. If you're using these kinds of teachings to try to earn your way into God's favor and try to get him to accept you more and like you more, you're missing it. You see, we read God's word and we do what it says. And yes, we give a dime of every dollar. And yes, we keep the Sabbath holy. And yes, we treat people a certain way. Not to make God like us more. The reason we do those things is because he has so graciously, radically been generous to us that our heartfelt response back to him is simply to obey out of love. It's not duty. It's not obligation. It's not rules. It's like, wow. In light of the incredible gift you've given me, in light of you sending your one and only son to die for me, man, I just want to come before you and I want to humbly honor and obey. That's the heart's motivation. It's not a rule. It's not a regulation to try to earn our way there. It's a a heartfelt response out of gratitude. You with me? The motivation matters greatly. So, The first change this invalid man makes is this. He decides he's going to remove legalism from his life. He rejects it. There's a second change he makes. It comes down in verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple, which is an amazing place for this guy to be because for 38 years he has not been permitted to go there. He's been an invalid. He couldn't go. He said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Here is the man's second change. He begins to live a life that's dedicated to the worship of Jesus. He simply worships Jesus. That's what he does. That's his response. Jesus found him. Jesus saw him in the crowd, gathered there at the pool. And Jesus knew his heart condition and Jesus healed him on the spot. And now we see here in scripture, after this guy is healed, his response is to go to the temple to worship. He goes to the temple to worship. And there he finds Jesus. 
Now, I cannot tell you all the reasons that we should worship. But we just need these times in our lives where we gather with other people like we are gathered right here. And we put all of our stuff on hold. And we say, you know what? Checking my bracket doesn't matter right now. Doesn't matter. For this, for this hour, it doesn't matter. And guess what? It doesn't matter where we're going to lunch. It doesn't matter what my grocery list is after I leave here. Man, for this time, I am solely focused on worshiping Jesus. That's all that matters. The, the cares of this world, they're going to take care of themselves. I'm here to worship the great I am. I am here to pour out my heart to the one who gave his all for me. Now, those times are so refreshing and so renewing when we come and we humbly worship him. But understand, there is a big distinction between worshiping Jesus and attending a worship service. There's a big difference. I don't know about you, but I have been guilty at times of just showing up and attending a worship service. Routine, it's habit, it's what I do, I'm supposed to, without bringing my heart, without bringing my... You see, worship here isn't about the message you receive from me or whoever's standing here. It isn't about the songs the band plays to lead us into God's presence, if you like them or not, if you heard them or not. It's not about what you get. Worship is about giving to the one who gave us all. That is a heart of worship. It's what we offer in return. This man of 38 years had not been able to go to the temple, and now that is where he encounters Jesus. So here's the deal. I hope that that inspires us to worship. In fact, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, I want to invite you right now to enter into to a time of worshiping Jesus. Will you do that? So let's just hit the pause button, and maybe you weren't realigned, and maybe you were going in different directions. Right now, let's change our focus and worship the great I am. Let's stand and pour out our hearts to him. Hey, thanks. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. So listen, this guy made some incredible changes in his life so that this power that Jesus had come to change him could be maintained and he could experience wholeness for the long haul. One of the things he did, he said, I'm going to reject legalism. And the next thing he said, I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm going to worship Jesus. There's a third thing that we see that takes place in this guy's life that allows this change to continue. And here's what it is. Just write this down and we'll unpack it. Here's a change for living out this life of wholeness. It's to stop sinning. Stop sinning. Now, we could probably just hit the stop button and leave right now, right? It's like, okay, that pretty well sums it up. Boom, done. Figure that one out and we'll be good, right? But here's the deal. Jesus found him at the temple. And look what verse 14 says. You are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. How many of you, that's just like the first time you've ever read that verse? Or you're going like, oh, well, what does he mean there? I don't have any idea. And you're going like, well, why don't we pay you? <laughs> I don't know what's all behind that verse. But there's a few things I do know about it. From reading and studying and praying... Even though I don't know everything behind it, apparently there was some sin in this guy's life that he was struggling with that led to this condition. Now, don't let your mind race and go, oh, so that is going to be my entire theology of sin and suffering. If I sin, if I do something wrong, then God punishes me and I get something. No, we don't read one verse and say, yep, that's everything in the Bible right there. That's not how we interpret Scripture, okay? Okay. We have to do it in light of the entire revelation that we have. So sometimes there are people who are sick. There is a condition they have, and it is a result of some sinful lifestyle, some habit. But that doesn't mean that everybody that has some kind of condition, it's being given to them because of a sin. So you've got to be careful how we interpret that. But here in this passage, the most natural reading is Jesus suggests here, he's pointing to this guy and says, there's something in your life that's caused this. But what he's pointing to at a greater and a higher level is not the sinning and the stop sinning piece. It's the idea and the concept of repentance is what Jesus is driving at in this guy's life. Repentance. Jesus came to this man and said, listen, hey, I have made you well. I have healed you. You are now whole. Stop sinning. 
If you don't allow me to come into your life and do something totally new, this wholeness that you've experienced will not be maintained. Now, there are people who come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and they have been radically changed. God has done a work in them that's like, wow. And they may get a little false hope along the way and go like, oh, wow, it's great learning about the nature and the character of God. You know, God at His care, He has to forgive. So I can do whatever I want during the week and He has to forgive me, right? Because that's His character. So I can do whatever I want, right? I can live, do whatever I want and still have the same joy and the same happiness and the same closeness that I have now, right? No. If you look at this at a deeper level, there's more at work, at play doesn't work out that way jesus is helping this man and he's saying listen the reason you are where you are is the touch the reason you are where you are is because i have healed you it doesn't mean that you have complete freedom to go out and sin the rest of your life without it affecting you and then jesus is like okay dude it's been 38 years 38 years you were an invalid the horrific reality of that existence pales in comparison to what's going to happen to you if you continue to sin. This guy had to be going, whoa, 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 what's going on? So at a deeper level, 38 years of sickness on this earth is nothing compared to an eternity separated from Christ. And there's people I know who've had some horrific illnesses, long, long lasting. As I has nothing compared, nothing compared to being without Jesus for eternity. So Jesus said, listen, live a life of repentance. Repentance. You know, that when I come across a verse like that one, and that phrase, stop sinning, I mean, it just hits me between the eyes. And and once again, I, I come and I realize the gravity, the seriousness of sin. And I'm going like, wow. That part of my life that's, inconsistent with the teachings of scripture serious business it may seem like it's a harmless word or a careless thought or a missed opportunity and you're going like see i knew it was about legalism i knew it was about a list of rules no 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 it's not but i understand the seriousness of my sin and what it does between me and my relationship with others here as well as my relationship with god If we could just see our sins as God sees them, I think our life would be different. It'd be different. Stop sinning. There's one other other change this guy made in his life. We see it in verse 15. The man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Here's another change this guy made. He openly confessed Jesus is the Son of God. He openly confessed Jesus is the Son of God. Think in your life right now about people in your sphere of influence, in your relational world, who need Jesus as their Savior. It may be somebody at the gym. It may be somebody at school. It may be somebody at work. It may be a neighbor. And just think about them for a second. Think about the place and think about the person. And then figure out a way in your mind right now that the Holy Spirit could guide you to be bold in your faith. Now there's a key word I just used in that sentence. It is the word bold. I didn't say obnoxious. I didn't say weirdo wacko. See, some people are like, man, those Christians, they're just weird. Now I understand in Scripture we're called a peculiar people. But it doesn't mean that we're supposed to be like weird and obnoxious in our faith. No, we're supposed to live life being different, but in a way that is attractive, that allows conversations to be had so that we can give witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Not weird, bold, bold in our faith. See, after this man is told to clean up his life, He encounters Jesus in the temple, and then it's abundantly clear who healed him. You remember maybe a few moments ago, we read in this text where the guy said, was asked by the Pharisees, who healed you? And he went, 
I don't know who did it because Jesus had slipped into the crowd. Now there's been an encounter with Jesus in the temple and it's abundantly clear who did this. It was Jesus. Jesus healed him. And now this guy, this invalid, former invalid, goes to the Pharisees, the people who could have killed him because it was, he was breaking the law by carrying something weighing more than a fig on a Sabbath, right? And it was punishable by death. He goes and he finds them and he says, okay, I know who it was. It was Jesus. He found me, he touched me, and he healed me. It was Jesus. Now remember, every time we see a miracle in the Bible, we're not to dial in on what Jesus did solely or who received it and how it changed their life. It is to give a witness. It's to authenticate the character of Jesus, the message of Jesus, all for the glory of God. And here this guy comes and he tells these Pharisees, it was Jesus. He was proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God. And that is something that's repeated all throughout the Gospel of John. We saw it in verse, I mean in chapter 1, that Jesus is God. And here we see again, Jesus is the Son of God. Now, how many of you have red letter Bibles? Anybody have still have one? Okay, I see a few out there, okay? If you're, if you're tracking with me in text, you're going to see that it's getting ready to turn red for like a column and a half in my Bible. Jesus is throwing down. Okay? He's throwing down a lot of words. And you're going like, well, what's he going to say? Now, sometimes people say, okay, here are the red letters. They got to matter more. No, 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 no. Understand, cover to cover, every word is equally inspired by the Holy Spirit. These happen to be the words of Jesus. But guess what? They're all equally inspired. But Jesus is getting ready to explain what it means to be the Son of God. What it means to be the Messiah. What it means to be the Savior. What does it mean to openly confess Jesus is the Son of God? Look at verse 17. Jesus said to them, My Father is always at work, always at work, to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, carrying that fig, right? But he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Oh, this drove the Pharisees nuts. But here Jesus is telling us he is the Son of God. He's telling us the Son is equal to the Father. The Son is equal to the Father. The rabbis condemned Jesus for this, but he did not deny it. He did not fight it. He did not reject it. He did not try to explain it away. He says, I'm equal with the Father. That is what it means to be the Son of God. He is equal with the Father. Jesus is equal. There's something else that we learn about being the Son of God. It comes starts in verse 19. Jesus continues to speak. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. Now some of your translations will say verily, verily. Some might say truly, truly. Whichever it is, just know this. This is Jesus saying, hey, don't miss this. This is important. Get this. Here it comes. Be ready. Here he goes. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all He does. Yes, to your amazement, He will show Him even greater things than these. In just a couple of phrases, Jesus gives us the formula, if you will, to live a power-filled life, to live a life where the wholeness continues forever. Here's what he says. It's so simple. He says, the son does what he sees the father doing. So if if I'm in your shoes this morning, it's like, okay, there's like two big things right there, pretty close together. It's like, stop sinning. Oh, okay. Okay, well, how am I going to do that? Um, I'm going to do what the father does. Oh, it's easy, right? But there, where's the list of rules and regulations? No, 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 no. We're following because our heart has been so changed by his incredible gift of Jesus that we humbly come and say, what can I do in return to show you my love? I obey you. I obey. He does what he sees the Father doing. How many of you remember back in the day playing Simon Says? For those of you who are too cool to have played the game, whatever follows, Simon says, 
is what you do. Simon says, and if it's just an instruction, you don't. It has to be preceded by Simon says. Jesus had this cool game he played called Father Says. His Father Says. Whatever Father Says, I do. Whatever Father Says, I do. And that's what you and I as followers of Jesus should incorporate into our lives. Whatever the Father Says, we do. Father Says. Last week we saw that Jesus makes us whole. This week we've turned the corner. And we see, and we see that not only does Jesus make us whole like he did this invalid guy, he keeps us whole. How does he keep us whole? It's not by lists and regulations. It's not by rules. He keeps us whole as we reject legalism. We stay whole and we stay connected to Jesus. What? As we worship him. We stay connected and whole as we stop sinning. We stay connected as we suddenly begin to confess openly Jesus is the Son of God. You're going, oh, okay, but what do I do? What, what, what's next, Daryl? I mean, there's got to be a to-do list, right? Well, no, but I would give you something to evaluate your life with. I, I, and, and I put some writing on my sermon notes, and you can track right there with me. If you're a believer in Jesus, just sort of say, okay, my life has been radically changed. Now what? I mean, okay, I need to reject legalism. I, I, it's not rules and regulations. And that's not what works. It's the fact my life has radically been changed, and because of that, I'm going to pursue Jesus. There's some things I'm going to do in my life. I'm going to offer up to him. So we got to stop the rules and pursue Jesus in love. I look at this idea of worshiping Jesus. Man, every single time we have the opportunity to gather corporately, put your agendas aside. I'll put mine aside, and we're just going to worship the great I am. We're just going to passionately pour out our hearts to God in worship. See, some people think that, man, uh, I come to church because I either I like the music or my kids like the kids' ministry or the messages. Yeah, I can endure them for at least 30 minutes. Um, no, 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 no. You don't come here to get something. You come here to give something. You come here to give your heart of worship and praise to Jesus. That is why we gather. That is worship. It's what we give, not what we get. We worship Jesus. So are we worshipers? Stop sinning. I mean, just think about it. Is there an habitual, repetitive sin in your life? Maybe it's your speech. Maybe it's, it's anger. Maybe it's the love of stuff. What is it in your life that could keep you from maintaining your wholeness? Not that you work your way to God, but sin will cripple our walk. Openly confess Jesus as the Son of God. Who in your life do you know that you need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to give you that opportunity to share Jesus openly? He is the Son of God. He has a plan for their life. Hey, in next month, in just a few weeks, actually, I think it's like four weeks from today, is Easter Sunday. You're going to have five opportunities that weekend to invite your friends to service, to a service. Saturday night at 5.30 and 7, we'll have Easter services here. Sunday morning at 8.30, 9.50, 11.10, our regular schedule right here. Five opportunities for you to invest and invite people to openly hear about Jesus. Now, maybe you're not a Christ follower, and you're here and you're going like, man, I just don't know why I'm here. I don't know if I, is, is there anything in here for me? How do I incorporate and implement this into my life? Here's how. Jesus desires for you to know him personally. He wants to intersect your life just like he intersected the life of this invalid. He wants to radically transform you. He wants to radically change your life. And today you have been given witness to the fact that he is worthy. In fact, there's one verse I would point out to you that we did not cover this morning out of this section of scripture. It's in verse 24. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from, what's that phrase? From what? From death to life. This morning you're here and you have the opportunity, the invitation has been given to cross over from death to life. We've given witness. In fact, you can look at verses 31 to 47 in this chapter and there's all kind of witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. You can look at Abraham, I mean Moses. Um, you can look at Jesus himself. You can look at our witness in our lives. So here's the deal. Would you openly confess him today? Would you believe in him so that you could cross over from death to life? Let's pray.
Jesus, thank you for this time of worship. And I pray for every Christ follower who is gathered here that they would make the necessary changes they need to make so that they can experience the joy and the vitality of your love to keep them whole. And God, I pray for anyone here who does not know you personally. Our prayer is that they would sense the Holy Spirit drawing them to faith and that they would respond to your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.